Thank you for joining us. Welcome to this Hay Festival digital special event, a Hay Book of the Month live Q&A with Inua Ellens, who won this year's Hay Festival Poetry Medal for this fantastic book, The Half God of Rainfall. We're going to take questions from you all around the world, and I see there are people joining us from three or four on our continents. Welcome to all of you. Inno is going to read a bit, we're going to introduce the book a little, and we welcome at any point questions from all of you, and we'll put them to him, and then conclude with a reading after about 45 minutes. Inua, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Could we ask you just to introduce this whole beautiful book with a short reading from the very beginning, from book one of the first act. Yes, absolutely. Um, this is how um, the story begins. <clears throat> Orumila, the god of vision and fiction, whose unique knowing is borderless, whose wisdom unmatched, who witnessed the light of all creation, to whom all stories are lines etched deep in his palms. From the heavens above Nigeria, read the calm of oncoming conflict, shook his head and looked down. The local voice had chosen ground not too far from the river so a cold breeze could blow them twisting in the heat. The boys had picked clean its battered palms, leaves left from previous years to make this their grounding, their patch, their pitch. These local lads leveled it flat and stood two shortened telephone poles up, centering both ends of the fields. Then they mounted tires, strapped one atop each pole and stitched strips of fishing nets to these black rims. Court lines were drawn in charcoal, mashed into a paste, and the soil held the dark pigment, the free throw lines glistening geometry, perfect. They called it Battle Kings, the Court of Kings, the Test. For this was where warriors were primed from the rest, where generals were honored and mere soldiers crushed. Basketball was more than sports. The boys were obsessed. They played with a righteous thirst. There were parries, thrusts, shields and shots, strategies and tactics, land won and lost, duels fought, ball like a missile, target to lock, such that Ogun, the Orisha god of war, would stand and watch. He'd stand and watch the gods were watching on. One child named Demi was kept from play. He was banned. He'd crouch on the edge of the court, watching the boys turn and glide in the reach towards the rim, a chasm, a cavernous emptiness between him and them. He was banned from games, for if they lost, tears would come. Demi would drench his shirt, soak his classroom and flood whole schools as once he'd done their pitch, the soil swollen, the pole sunk. It all turned to swamp for weeks. Their lifeblood, the balletic within them, their game had been stalled. They never forgave him for turning their worlds to mud. They resented more than a fear Demi and called him town crier, loud, mercilessly chanting this as they crossed over the brown orb dribbling. They called town crier, watch this. <laughs> they worshiped Michael Jordan ripped his moves from old games. They'd practice trash talking, those dark boys, skin singing to the heat. They tried to fit Nigerian songs around American accents, close but not close enough. That's all you got, man. <laughs> Gotta do better, man. Your mask so fat, giant clothes, no fit cover her ass. Till the fist fight broke through the game and war spilled out, the gods laughing, the ball rolling towards Demi, who that day, bent to scoop it up, desperate to join their lush coral. And all he asked for was one shot, the four foot four of him quivering on the court. No, said Bolu, too tall, the king of the court. You miss and cry, boys, grab him. Demi fought in their grip, eyes starting to water. Just one shot, or, or, or I'll cry and drown this pitch, he screamed, his voice slicing the sky, clouds gathering over. You small boy, you know, get shame. Right? Remember this belt. Pass the ball before I whip you even harder. 
But the king's voice hushed as the earth began to melt. The soil dampened, telephone poles tilt, and great tears pool in Demi's wild eyes. Far off, Modupe felt that earth wane. Modupe, Demi's mother, her fears honed by her child, knowing what damage loose wild water could do, let loose on land, left everything. Her ears seeking Demi's distinct sobbing, the market where she worked, utter chaos in her wake, in her vaults over tables stacked with fruits and fried goods, the air parting for her, the men unable to find fault in the thick limbed smooth movement that was her full form. Back on the court, Demi held on as the boys waltzed around his pinned down form beneath the threatening storm. Just one shuttle, one, the arena turning malt beneath them. Alarmed, the king yelled, fine, but uh, shoot from where you live. Hmm. Demi spat the soil out his mouth, hunched till he could see one dark rim, gathered his sub back into him and let fly the ball, his face down, crunched. Years later, Bolu would recount that shot, its arc, its definite flight path, the slow rise, peak, and wane of its fall through the fission net, swish, its wet thwack on damp earth, the skies clearing, then silence. Again, Bolu said, pushing the ball to his chest, again, then we do it again. And the crowds went insane. The rabble grew and swirled around them on a plane of damp soil, chanted again each time Demi drained the ball down the net. Mudupe arrived and craned her neck but couldn't glimpse Demi, so a fountain of worry, she splashed at one. What happened? Tell me. You didn't see? <laughs> Town crier can't miss. He just became the rain man. <laughs> Make it rain, baby. Yeah, shoot that three. Ten more shots, each flawless, and the hoisted Demi onto their shoulders, his face a map of pure glee. Two things Madupe would never forget. That glee when Demi became the rain man was the second. The first, the much darker, how Demi was conceived. So that's the first book. Utterly magical. Listen, I want to come to Modupe in a minute, but before we do, tell me about the man who introduced you to, to poetry and basketball. Yes. Um, um, I moved to Dublin when I was 15 years old, um, to Ireland. And um, my the, the PE teacher at the time, who was also the basketball coach, was a man called um, Mr. Nolan, Senon Nolan. And it, he was also um, the English teacher. And it baffled me that he could be so brilliant, so detailed and so precise in both things. One of them required our minds, our brains to be invested in the specificity and the precision of words. And the other expected um, the same thing from our bodies on the court, you know, on the running track, on the basketball court. And he applied as much precision and demanded as, and demanded as much conviction and, and determination and hard work from us in both um, on and off the court, in the classroom and on the basketball court. And, um, and I think I, I learned to love both things from him. And um, yeah, he, he drilled the, um, the beauty of, of both the sports and, um, and, of, and of the genre um, into me. And I don't think, I think I'm a writer because of him, but also I, I continue to play basketball because of him. And this was over, um, over yeah, twenty years ago now. It's, it's it's incredible. Tell me about the language of this, because we, we gave this book the medal for poetry, but the way you perform it and the way I think it was first conceived was definitely as a play for performance, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I had I had the the the, the little notions the to write a story about a young boy who could do all the things that I couldn't do on the basketball, basketball court. And um, those were the first inklings, the first sparks um, um, of this story. And I began to um, develop the idea just for a few you know, months, just running it back and forth in my head. 
and until um, I was approached by the Kiln Theatre in Kilburn, at the time it was called the Tricycle, to pitch a story, a play. And I pitched um, the story of the half god of rainfall. However, I, I played fast and loose with the form in which the story would be developed, in, in which I, I'd present the play. And at the time, I began to um, read more of, of the classic um, Greek plays. Um, um, and um, it, slowly, it slowly began to come together as, um, as, as a poem that would riff on what um, writers like Homer and Dante gave, gave to the world of literature. But I really wanted it to be contemporary, to be urban, um, to be Nigerian, to be American, to borrow a lot of the tricks of American vernacular and of hip hop specifically. So when he came to writing, um, to, to, to writing and developing the story, I began thinking about the hexametrical tertiarima, or the tertiarima, which was um, the form in which um, Dante wrote the Inferno. But when I wrote the very first um, book in that um, form, I found it a little bit too restrictive. The rhymes at the end were too harsh and didn't allow for the fluidity with which hip hop is constructed, which uses a lot of internal rhymes um, and a lot of, you know, like half, scanning wordplay in order to allow myself the freedom to conjure that musical register, that um, linguistic register, but also um, the Nigerian and also the little bit of the Irish lilt, which informs the way that I write. I needed to expand the meter. So um, from a sort of 10 syllable meter, I expanded it to 12 syllable meter, and that gave me a lot of freedom to play. So I still had adhered to very fixed rhyme scheme at the end of each line, but within it is scattered with, with literary allusions or rhyme schemes right up through, which gives um, the space for deeper musicality to be invested in the text, which is why when I perform um, the poem, my whole body gets involved with it because they're all of these sub rhythms which I, I dance to, I gravitate towards. And within this absolutely perfect mixing of cultural references, which extends to pantheons of gods, yeah. comes, I guess, at the time that you're writing and thinking about this, the full weight of the Me Too movement and the idea of restitution of some of these classical and antique stories and myths mm. so would you just before we start taking questions from everybody who's watching would you just introduce modupe for us and and that first time yeah um this is this is book two um and this is the introduction into modupe um, and modupe is denny's mother they say when, when Modupe was born, her own mother who worshiped the God of vision and fiction screamed when she foresaw the future looks of her daughter, the iridescent moon she'd resemble, the dreams she'd seen to men and thus the objects she'd become. Her mother had known these men her whole life, had seen them all from the weak and pathetic, overcome by lust, to warlords who, to crush rebellion, would attack the women to daunt their men and sons. She'd suffered such brands of violence that had churned her for years. Knowing her child would need protection from a god who could wash the eyes of men and numb their hot senses, the young mother took swift action, stole her child to the shrine of the river goddess Oshun. She prayed for protection, poured libation, straddled her daughter, and to show conviction lest or should think this a token act, split her own womb with a knife, the blood pooling on her daughter's chest. Skies above Nigeria, far above the gloom in the heavens over earth, where the Orisha, the Yoruba gods and goddesses lived and loomed, Oshu wailed. Voice like cyclones, she swore an oath as Madupe's mother bled. No mortal man would know this child, no one will come near. She swore to the star through galaxies, galaxies dark. Oshun's oak shook black holes. Woe to those who would test me, to those who would try. She made Madupe her high priestess, her go to, her vessel, herself on earth, and built her 
a shrine and compound by the river's edge where the soil soaked with water meant Modupe could wind, could move land, unwind the swamp into a weapon should she be provoked. And though it became widely known that Madupe was untouchable, it never stopped men. It stoked their prying eyes and their naked hunger. On clear eyes, they'd secretly watch her. They'd see the full moon beaming to the rippling waters where she bathed. The water like liquid diamonds cocooned her with light. This happened years later when she was fully grown and legends of her beauty had bloomed into foolish, shameful, shameless, lustful moans and prayers pitched to Shangu, the brash god of thunder, who too would grab his godhood. Gaze at Madupe, pause to stroke himself. If she could humble thunder too, how safe was she among men? In his palace up among storm clouds, Shango squeezed himself slow, imbued with dreams of her beneath him. Dark skin ripe, breast cupped, when boom, rang the doors of his palace. The door shook, boom, I am the god of thunder. Who dares interrupt? Oh, uh, uh, greetings, Oshu. She swept in, her garments took the, thick, the dip thick greenish tinge of low waves. Her crown quaked with new moon jewels. The river goddess, angry, shook. Shango, that's Modupe. You shouldn't even take a peek. You know the oath I took. Yes, but nothing. Now go clean yourself. Ugh. I bring news for your own sake. Moments later, Shango returned, low thundering with each step. Don't suck now. Uh -uh. Now. I know his name angers you, but the Greek god king Zeus is warring and mankind again is at risk. Murupe's name is drawn among the list of likely casualties if you react, Shango now. Our sage who has tamed all possibilities, or Rumi now who sees all stories, him, our god of vision and fiction, who saw the light of all creation, sends his pleas. Tonight he says, Shango, be still. Cause no friction, whatever happens, throw no thunder, hold your boat, for an omen rules the skies. Be wise, use caution. And just as Oshun spoke, then struck a lightning bolt. A ferocious white blaze shook the grand halls and struck its ancient paint with the confetti. Jolts of jolting bolts of fire burned the cracked pillars. Look how he mocked us thrice now, my dear. No. Shango grabbed his loudest thunder, his blackest fire, his closest friend, ducked before Oshun could utter any common words and was gone. Oshun stared from the broken stairs down to earth down at John Modupe and feared the worst. Thank you. And the worst happens. The worst happens, yeah. And, and the rest of the story plays out the implications of that worst. Can you tell us a little, before getting into that part of the story, a little more about these gods yeah. Tell us about Oshun and Shango. Is there a is there a pantheon like the familiar Olympians that we know from from Greek mythology? Yeah, that have the same sort of uh, portfolios, as it were. Absolutely, there is um, a, an equivalent as rich, as complicated, as intense, as problematic um, pantheon of gods that exist in in um, in Nigeria. They originate from from Southwest Africa. From, from West Africa, they originate among the, um, the Yoruba ethnic tribe, which make up a huge um, 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 section of the Nigerian population. And within them, there are a number of, of gods. There's a Rumila, who is probably the equivalent to a figure like Zeus. He is the father um, and, and the beginner, the father, the, the most revered of all um, um, of, of the gods. There is Shango, who is the god of thunder. There is um, Oshu, who's the river goddess. There's Yomo Yomoja, who's the ocean goddess. And, and, and all of these characters were there at the, the creation of earth itself, at the, at the, and, and at the creation of life. Obatala was the creation of humanity himself. 
And um, the Pantheon is so rich and the story is so diverse that it even make um, allowances within Obatala's creation myths of humanity for those of us who are um, intellectually disabled, for instance, those of, those of us who may have um, Down syndrome um, and, and, and all of these humans who are born differently are, are called children of a battle because um, he got, um, the story goes, he got into a little bit of a drunken um, um, rage whilst he was making humanity. But those um, who he made um, under the influence of alcohol are those he cares for even more. Um, so um, it's, it's just a rich, a rich source of stories that teach us about um, the different genders, how they interact with the primi primordial creations of Earth. And I drew lots of inspiration from them when I was um, creating the story. Um, there's a, a a question here from Cairo. With uh, it's an astonishingly uh, pertinent to the next section that you're going to read. I think uh, who she asks, she or he asks, are you are your characters inspired or based upon real people you know? <laughs> Um, Demin initially began based on myself um, as a young, unskilled basketball player, and I wanted to create someone who could do all the things that I do, as I couldn't do. But other characters in the story are real. I blended reality with fiction. Um, Demi himself is partially based on on, um, on a basketball player who plays for the Golden State Warriors, um, um, and this is this is the flag of the Golden State Warriors. Um, uh, and the character I'm referring to is called Steph Curry. He is one of the most accurate um, um, basketball players and shooters in the history of the NBA. His stats um, are, are ridiculous. He does things where he takes um, backward shots from the halfway line, with the, you know, with his back to the court, and he swishes it. It's 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 kind of incredible. And in the story, um, I make myth of all the legendary basketball players from characters like um, uh, Michael Jordan, who the world knows, to um, Hakim Olajuwon, who's a Nigerian basketball player and comes into the play as a conduit who progresses and, and, and moves the story leaps and bounds forward. Um, I mentioned people like Alan Iverson, um, and yes, yeah, so there, there are lots of, of real characters who pop up as figures in the story. Now, I, I want to come back to that moment with Hakeem, who you tell me, to my complete delight, now lives in Birmingham. <laughs> but, but let me just let me just cut back to the core of this story. Yeah. Um, Emma asks a question, well, asks the question, actually. Uh, Modupe asks, what exact regime teaches males to take what isn't given? Yeah. Now, she asks, how would you answer this? And the answer is, with this story. But it is, it is the question for now, isn't it? It is, it is the question. And it's something that I've, that I've come back to time and time again that I keep addressing and, and re-addressing. And, um, and the simplest answer is um, the education of, and the normalization of toxic masculinity and how much of our world it governs in every echelon, in every space. And, 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 and it is why, it, it, it is the regime, it is taught to us in books, in films, in poetry, um, in, in epic stories, the valor, the valorification of, of war, the language the, of, of, of the theater of war, all of those stories keep, keep um, telling men that it is okay to do this, to go forth and conquer. Um, imperialism, colonialism, all of those things begin with this, with this narrative of a white man, of, of men going out to war, to take, to come back, to rape and to pillage. And, 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 and it carries on to this day. Um, it exists in, in the highest offices in government. Um, in the lowest um, offices as well. It's, it's, it's everywhere. That, that is the regime and this is what the book addresses. And, um, and what I've come back to time and time again in, in my plays, in my poetry, um, I keep on trying to unpick, unpick, to deconstruct, to educate, to share, to deepen the conversations about why and how men act in the world. 
the other incredibly contemporary resonance, which I guess you might have anticipated, but could not have anticipated on the scale, mm. is the degree to which this is a, a story about justice and justice against a white abuser. Zeus yeah. is clearly a white god, and this book falls right into the heart of the Black Lives Matter movement. Nicola has asked a question about whether actually, and it, not specifically about the book, but it, uh, it, it invites you to comment on whether you think the Black Lives Matter movement has reached any kind of tipping point now. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement started just under a decade ago with two black women, <laughs> all these black women leading revolutions. And it started after Trayvon Martin had been killed. And um, 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 the woman whose name escapes me now, I, I, um, um, I will return to her, um, was writing um, on Facebook and she was grieving his death. And she just put a post saying to black people, what has happened to Trayvon, to Trayvon is horrific. Um, the world might not think your lives are beautiful, it is worth, but, but, but your lives matter. And she woke up the following morning and there were lots of responses to people. And a few of those were community organizers, also women of color, black women, who she reached out to and they began a conversation. And at first, the idea, just the phrase itself, Black Lives Matter, drew so much vitriol, she couldn't believe how problematic it seemed the notion was. And, um, and over the years, incrementally, it passed from this obscure three-word notion into something that forced a deeper conversation, which um, the death of George Floyd catapulted into a global conversation. And I think if the American president hadn't responded the way he had, the world wouldn't have responded the way they had. But I don't think it's rich the zenith. I think it's deep in conversations, but there are miles to go. Worlds don't change overnight. Um, toxic masculinity um, began um, arguably since before the Bible existed, since the creation of Adam and Eve, in which um, this, you know the snake bit Eve, and suddenly she became the bearer of all of all the ills of humanity. The story begins there. Um, so George Floyd um, and the death and the and the catapulting of the Black Lives Matter into this global conversation um, is the biggest and perhaps um, um, the most detailed, the most far-reaching chapter in a story. But the story isn't over by no stretch of the imagination. Um, this is not its end. This is a big chapter, but it's going to carry on. There's a lot of work to be done. I I want to come back to Hakeem in a minute. But just before I do, there's a question that Bethan asks, actually, which is not about this book, but relates to it in that um, you are again writing about uh, strong black women in your adaptation of Chekhov's Three Sisters. Bethan was asking, did you come from it, come to it wanting to write about the Biafran War and find Chekhov as the vehicle, or did you find that the Chekhov story fitted a, a cultural context that you already had? Um, I have three sisters and they have and continue to be the strongest people that I know. I draw strength from them. Um, um, I, try, I try to be strong for them. And I was born into a household in which the person who commanded my life was my older sister, which is to say um, I, I, I had no qualms with being ruled um, by women. When I left Nigeria um, and came to the UK, when I began to go to school and, and reach adolescence, was when I, I became aware that the world didn't um, see women the way I did. And, and I wanted to, to address that. And I have been since I started writing. Um, but when it came to writing Three Sisters, initially I was asked to adapt um, something of, of Chekhov's and various plays um, um, were, were, were brought to my attention. And um, the only reason why I chose Three Sisters is because I had Three Sisters. I thought, okay, brilliant. I could just write about, about my sisters and put these strong women at, um, who, who I love, who have, been, who, have, um, who have been with me my whole life, finally put them 
on a platform. And that's, that was my, my clearest, um, I'm, my most sincere impulse. But in doing so, um, in reading more and more about the Biafran War, um, I realized what comments I could really make about Nigeria at the time, about the sexism that existed, how it interplayed with the politics um, of, of the time, but also about how the global politics, everything from the legacy of colonization to the Cold War between um, the US and Russia and Britain sort of played a part in making this war even more toxic. And, but definitely putting my three sisters in those contexts deepen all of those stories, all of those notions for me and taught me how to think of Chekhov, how to think of Nigeria at the time and make those stories more relatable um, and more, um, 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 is, is political the right? No, more relatable and more um, pressing for a contemporary British and contemporary Nigerian audience. Um, Jill asks, and partly the answer to this is read the book. Um, <laughs> available at all digital bookshops and from your local bookstores, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yes. But it's also a, a great question because, because it again cuts to the heart of the matter. She says, I couldn't stop wondering, did Madupo's mother's womb sacrifice kill her? Um, did Madupo's mother's womb sacrifice kill her? Um, it isn't um, something that I addressed in the book. Um, but I think I think it I think it did because um, um, it was going to be a play and the nature of theater is collaboration. I wanted to keep um, moments of the story open, which the cast, myself and the director, would negotiate together and decide what repercussions it would have on how the actors um, played those characters. Um, so I, I'm not entirely sure. I think it might have. Um, but um, I've begun to think about what a sequel um, for this book might look like, just playing with ideas in my head. And, and if she's still alive, um, um, and given that I haven't addressed it, I think she could still be alive and play a part in, in, in what happens to Medupa in the next chapter, in what Nigeria becomes and what Greece becomes when the seat of power is left empty, empty by what happens to Zeus at the end. So. Um, um, I, I'm not entirely sure. Um, the question is all, also more pressing because of um, the YouTube um, personality who died in childbirth and just how many um, um, black women um, die in childbirth here in the UK. Um, so there are definitely things that have been spinning in my mind regarding what happens um, to Ludupe's mother and what she can come back as. Um, yeah, so the short answer of the question is still, is still open and it's a good one. I, I love the idea of um, the actors being co-makers of this whole story with you. What for you is the role of the, the listener or the audience then, or the reader of this story? What are you asking of us? Um, like all theater, um, its completion is only when it's presented before um, an audience. When the, theater, when the theater makers, um, the actors and the director are sat in the laboratory, as it were, making, kindling, figuring out how to tell the story, what, what aspects of the symphony to dial up and dial down. All of that is mathematics, is musical mathematics, is to do with our bodies, et cetera, with space and light and sound. But the completion of the equation is when the story, when we have, what we have kindled is put before an audience. That is where the fire, rages and becomes a furnace. So um, for the audience, for in, in terms of theater, it isn't complete without an audience, it's just us. But um, for the reader, um, I think it goes back to, to, for me, what I think the job of poetry is. And I think poetry's primal job is to be a witness. To say, this is the world as I perceived it, as I've experienced it. This is, and, and I, I'm gonna share this with you. And I think um, the job for the reader and the listener to those who get the audiobook is to witness, is to listen, is to understand, to, be imb to imbibe these stories, these characters, these notions, and ask yourself what, 
what it evokes in you, what settles within you, um, how you can take these stories further in your life and to share them and to, to see the spaces of power in which, in which you occupy and, what, um, and how to fill the answers those spaces ask of you, um, the questions of those spaces ask, ask of you, the answers from, the, from these books or questions or vice versa. Um, yeah, I think, I think um, it, it is to digest and to echo, to carry on. At the end of this extraordinary poem, play, book, story, there is an incredibly satisfying climax which will thrill you, whoever you are as a reader. And there is an exploration of justice and the scale of, of godlike brutality and indifference to humankind. But there's also quite a lot that explains stuff about basketball yeah. and i would love you just before we close here to read a little from the moment that this great nigerian star comes to demi to just sort things out and and explain a few things about yeah. sporting world too um one of um the greatest basketball players who has ever lived um is called Hakim Olajuwon, who was a giant um, of Nigerian heritage, um, who won a scholarship to America and, um, and began playing in the NBA. And um, he plays a pivotal part in the story. Um, and this is his entrance into the story. It takes place um, when Demi has relocated to, um, to California. He's now playing for the Golden State Warriors. He's now a star. And, um, and the more powerful he gets, the more problems he poses for the gods. And Akeem comes to speak with him. It's set in Demi's um, apartment. The last pair of eyes arrived with a cough, a polite request for some of Demi's time. Yes, please, of course. So <laughs> our, god, our half god replied and ushered in the slim, light footed gentleman. Sit, Hakim Olajuwon, you are a legend. I can't believe my sight. Ha! Here, yeah, my boys will die when I tell them you won back to back championships in 1994 and 5. The first Nigerian to, ah, you are a don, Hakim the Dream Olajuwon, please. Demi poured gin and cracked two color nuts as is tradition, but saw the small talk, laughter, and pleasantries thaw as a large one took a large last gulp and shunned Demi's offer of more. He asked harshly, Parents, who are they? My parents, <laughs> that's free information. Mother's name is Modupe, father's been absent. See, I never knew him. And are they both mortal? Uh, pardon? And Samuel Ludemi, this instant. Uh, Hakim, uh, you have overstayed your welcome. The hall is, I've watched you play. You are one of us. Our sage, Demi Orumila, my grandfather. There's a roll call of half gods. Alonso Morning comes from Kali, the Hindu goddess, destroyer of ignorance. Iverson, greatest ball handler, Vishnu. Reggie Miller, Satet's son, archery goddess. Leprechauns made Kevin McCabe of the, Celt of the Celtics and Edo Wedo, rainbow snake goddess, Dennis Rodman's aunt. Clyde Drexler descends from a Prometheus, that old great Greek. Alvis, Norse god of wisdom, Jason Kidd's great, great grandfather. The years we played were pure gold, all gone. We had to sign a pact after the kid, after Jordan. What happened? Jordan, that far-flung son of Amun Ra, oldest of gods, Jordan did what no one had dared, flew on the court with no song, charm, or spell to cloak his flight. Live television. Grandfather had to wipe memories, everyone's. Think of the effort it took to weave new visions for millions of people, to plant them seamlessly. That brought forth the agreement. With no exception, half gods were forbidden from mortal sports and we agreed to be phased out. We stood by it till you, 
So tell me, who defies the agreement? Tell me, who is your father? <laughs> Enua, it's wonderful. Thank you so, so much for sharing this. And thank you for joining us for this Q&A. Thank, you, thank you too to my colleagues, Poppy and Joe, and to all the crew who've made this happen. We will be back next month on the 18th of August with a live Book of the Month Q&A with the author Matt Haig. You can register now or register when you get an email from us, but please join us now. Go out, share this book with everyone you know and love. It is a joy. Inua Elams, thank you very much indeed.